Look at this. I got ZFS boot menu everywhere, dog. I got it on my NAS. I got it on Chewy. Chewy. I got, I think that's actually all of them. Wait, we got one more. It's the workstation. I don't know how I missed that. Don't look at the cables. Now that I'm done yelling at you, you're probably wondering two things. First off, what the heck is this mess? And second, what's a ZFS? Or ZFS, I'm going to keep flipping back and forth between the two of them. Essentially, ZFS is a file system and a volume manager merged together. So those two components are traditionally separate. So you might have a file system like XT4, super common on Linux, and a volume manager like LVM. ZFS puts those two things together. I'm not gonna go into the technicals of why that's awesome and how that makes things simpler. Instead, I'm gonna tell you about why I use ZFS at all. Aside from the fact that every sysadmin podcast can't stop talking about how good ZFS is, I actually get some really good use out of it. RAID Z is fantastic for my NAS. It gives me a way to pool my disks together really easily and just deal with them in sort of like one package. Data integrity stuff, I mean, data just goes bad eventually. Hard drives die and ZFS scrub gives you a way to check on the health of your drives from time to time. I set this to weekly. Most importantly to me though is snapshots. Uh, and this is just a personal thing. Uh, I had this one MacBook Pro that I had only owned for about a year. I was working on it one day, I got up to go take a pee, I come back and the thing just smells like burning solder. Uh, it was dead. 100%, I lost all the data on it that wasn't stored on Git somewhere, and from that point on, I was like, no, 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 snapshots all the time. And this sort of like triggered me into a data hoarder. So ZFS snapshots are fantastic. You can snapshot any ZFS file system you want. So you've got this great snapshotting system that lets you roll back to different versions whenever you mess something up. That's fantastic. But it's not a true backup just yet. Luckily for us, ZFS has the send and receive function. So if you snapshot a ZFS file system on one device, you can send it to another device on your network and it'll happily receive it and store that snapshot. Now you've got a real backup system because it's on a different device. And that's the thing I like most about ZFS, personally just because it deals with my, my past computer trauma. So we talked about the benefits of ZFS and we want to get that on all of our systems. It's fun, it's nice, it's good. But what's ZFS boot menu? What does that do? ZFS boot menu kind of fills the role of Grub, but instead of listing out, like, let's say a bunch of different distros you're hopping between, it instead lets you boot from a series of different snapshots of your root system. So now, whenever you're booting into your system, you get presented with this menu, a list of different snapshots of your root file system, and you can just select those and boot from them. So if you're messing around with something like you're adding new drivers or you're removing some software that might be core and you're not really sure what's gonna happen, or the most common thing, you're just like updating to a new version of whatever distro you're on and that God knows that can fail catastrophically. You can just hop back to the last snapshot if things go wrong and try again. At this point, like me, maybe you're sold, right? You're like, data integrity sounds awesome, features like RAID Z sounds great, snapshots and sending receive. This is fantastic. And I get to boot from snapshots and recover. This is great, especially for all those Arch Linux users whose systems break all the time. <laughs> Why aren't more people doing this? It's because it's a massive pain in the ass. Unfortunately, there's all this legal stuff. The Linux kernel is signed under like the GPL, the GNU public license, and then OpenZFS is signed under CDDL and these licenses, although both open source are not compatible with one another. And so you can't ship a Linux kernel, and that means a distro with ZFS support built in. Somehow Ubuntu did it, and I don't know how they got around it, and I'm not gonna touch that. The important part is, every time you wanna set up a machine with ZFS boot menu, you have to go down into the installer and do the setup yourself. That process is arduous, really easy to screw up, and just mostly a pain in the ass. So what did I do about it? Of course, on the final machine that I had to set up, that's when I decided, you know what, I, I think I actually know this well enough to be able to automate it. So, you know, hopefully somebody Hopefully you get some use out of this automation script that I've got. And so we're gonna jump into that now. Over the course of my many installations of ZFS boot menu on multiple Debian systems, these two guides have been my greatest resources. Unsurprisingly, the OpenZFS installation tutorial from 
the open ZFS team, and the ZFS boot menu. Now, I had to reference both because both were missing some things. The ZFS boot menu guide kind of leaves you with just the absolute minimal Debian system. This is like before doing even task select to really flesh it out or get a desktop environment going. And the open ZFS tutorial, of course, doesn't set you up with ZFS boot menu. So we got to do some in-between. What that meant for me was a lot, a, a lot of troubleshooting. Luckily, I put all of that troubleshooting into one tutorial for when I was setting it up for my dad's Debian server. I had this whole tutorial from my like last successful installation, which got really detailed. I went through step by step, merged the two the two guides as much as I could to, to end up with a working Debian system minus like a desktop environment because it's just like a server we're running, right? I do plan on releasing this guide. Probably it's gonna go on GitHub and then in the description of this video and things like that. Also on my website, nathanlaundry.com. But I also, I think more excitingly, have this as a shell script I'm about to share with you. Here she is in all her beauty. You know it's a good bash script because it starts with the shebang line. I don't know what I'm talking about. Let's take a look at the major steps here and then we'll dive into some more of the details. Here, towards the bottom of the script, we have the basically function calls and I've grouped them into major categories. First thing we're gonna do is let the user know we're starting an install. That's important. Next up, uh, we're prompting the user for a number of variables. Uh, so we do things like setting the disk, getting a username and password for the user that's about to get set up, uh, and then we generate this host ID. To be completely honest with you, I don't fully know what that does, but it's in the ZFS boot menu tutorial, and by God, I was not going to skip that step. So we do that, and then we're on to package management. We start by configuring app sources, because whenever you're doing kind of a basic Debian install, there's a number of possible sources that you can pull from, and the you have to list them in this config file. We need a few more than are included by default. So we're gonna throw that on there and then do some installation. At this point, it's important to note that pretty much all of this is intended to happen on some sort of live install media. So you'll drop out of the automated install procedure and instead just use the live ISO as a way to configure this other drive that you're actually installing Linux onto. And so naturally, we have to partition that disk. We create a Z pool on that disk and then we export that pool because currently it's sitting, it's living on that disk, let's say, and then we import it into our mount directory so we can do some configuration of it. Next, we set up the actual system. What we do here is run DE bootstrap, which creates a minimal Debian installation in the mount directory. We then prepare to change roots into that new system. I won't get into the details of how change root works. It's really cool though. If you've ever wanted a computer in your computer, change root. We have to do a bunch of preparation first, kind of mounting a bunch of the live directories. This is like devices, systems, and procs, uh, processes, so that the root that we're about to change into has access to a bunch of the kind of like live, let's call it dynamic data. We then enter it, do a ton of stuff from there to set up the actual installation. Then we exit the change root, we unmount, and then we do a bunch of final cleanup. And that's the gist of it. So we've talked about how the script works. Let's actually take a look at how to run it. Over here on the side, I've got github.com slash and laundry slash ZFS boot menu auto installer. It's the GitHub repo. There's a bunch of extra files in here. That's from past experiments. The important part is this setup dash ZFS boot menu dot sh. That's our shell script. Uh, if you jump down here, we've got readme stuff. This is the set of instructions we'll have to run. Over here on the left panel, I'm running Debian 12's live ISO, and I've already entered as root user running sudo su, and then I've updated and upgraded. So we're on to curling this long link. Okay, so we've curled it, and now we're gonna make it so that we can execute it with a little shamad action. Uh, we're gonna hit it with the pl plus X, so it's executable. We've got that going, and then we should be able to do this. So at this point, the script asks you for a series of disks if you have multiple available to you. In this virtual machine, of course, we've only got the one, so we're gonna tell it, hey, we're gonna use that one. It's also gonna prompt you for a user. My name's Nathan, so I'm gonna be doing that. Uh, we're gonna give it a password, the very secure password of 1234. We're also gonna give the root password 1234, and we're gonna call this host name Bob. So I'll be Nathan at Bob for this. <laughs> and off she goes. You'll see at this point, we've got uh, this question here about the licenses of OpenZFS and Linux. These are incompatible. We're gonna have to go ahead and say, yes, I acknowledge that I won't be redistributing an ISO with these two things put together. In the meantime, because this takes a while, Kobo, reading some Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. All right, I'm not gonna lie to you all. 
The install didn't quite work in the VM. We got really close and something about makefs vfat didn't work, which means dosfs tools isn't working the way that I wanted it to in the VM. I don't know. I could show you the failed installation on that VM. Instead, I'm gonna show you what it looks like on my working workstation, which did use this script to install things. And this right here is what we did all that work for. This is the ZFS boot menu. You can see I've got a list of different boot environments. I use Debian main for just about anything. And now we can jump over into snapshots of that boot environment. You can see I date them. I take these pretty regularly whenever I'm about to do something that I might screw up my system with. You can see post IBUS removal, for example. If anything ever goes wrong, it won't boot properly or something like that. I just revert back to the last snapshot, boot from there and try to fix it. We're good to go. I don't know what to tell you. Don't be a pleb, put ZFS boot menu on everything. 